Welcome to Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. I'm Cheryl Perrault, and your host. We are honoring songs and poems which have been influenced by observations on spirituality, global relations, and the human condition, with poets and authors Afa Michael Weaver, Diane Biliak, and singer-songwriter Anna Eder Mulhane. All three features have been inspired by a variety of diverse life experiences from their work, their spiritual questionings, their global encounters, and their mullings and observations of our day-to-day -day existence. And it's an honor to have them here this morning. I'd like to begin the program with Diane Biliak, who will be sharing some words with us in a few moments. Diane grew up in Stafford Springs, Connecticut, where she continues to live. As a child, she used to make up songs on a swing set with her sister. And in about second or third grade, I understand that her first poem of Halloween was received by a nun or a teacher at that time and hung on a bulletin board. And Diane said it was like winning the Oscar <laughs> since I got needs improvement grades in penmanship and music. <laughs> Diane went on uh, to graduate from Yale Divinity School through the Institute of Sacred Music, where she studied literature and religion. She's worked as a facilitator and leader of writers groups, as an editor for a number of different journals of poetry and writing. She is currently working as a developmental editor for science writers on a project titled Chimeras and Consciousness, and another interesting topic uh, a collected essays of trauma and grace that she's editing. And Diane recently completed a book based on interviews with a number of our country's famed contemporary poets regarding their thoughts and observations on spirituality as it relates to poetry. And Diane is going to share some of her findings and observations from this book project today and hopefully some of her own poetry as well. And I was curious to ask her, given this book project of hers, what if she thought then that the poetry was necessary for the human condition. And Diane responded in honesty, I don't know if I do. It's important for me and to me. I don't really elevate it as a stat to a status that outshines or overshadows something else. It's one meaningful way to communicate, to evolve, and to empathize, but there are many, many ways to do that. And she concluded, it's just one important way for us to revel in our aliveness and humanity. So I look forward to hearing what she has to share from her work and her own writing. Please help me welcome Diane Biliak. Thank you for having me. Thanks to um, my cousin Mike for coming, my friend Martha, and to Katie who introduced me to Cheryl. And also, uh, I need to thank Cheryl for all her help with this and um, this great service she offers to the community. And I also need to mention that I talk about God a lot throughout this and to me, that means a mysterious, ineffable other, a more holy spirit than formed being. But I know in all of your heads uh, and, and out in the world, we all have different experiences of what that means to us. I've been asked to uh, talk a bit about this project I've been working on for six years now. Uh, I'll talk about the origins of that, discuss some of the interviews, and finally, if there's time, share some of my poems. So I started these interviews in 2001 with Lee Young Lee. Um, and then when I became a student in 2003, I was studying literature and religion, and I decided that for my thesis project, I would continue to interview poets um, and focus on the intersection between poetry and religion and this, the writing process. Since then, they've taken on a life of their own. And in general, luck and chance and the help of many people have been major forces in securing each interview. Though I feel blessed to be in the company of so many great writers, the, in the early interviews, I was nervous. Therefore, I developed a precise process to prepare questions. I'd gather as many materials as I could, books, articles, and other interviews, and furiously read everything over a week's time. Then a few hours before the questions were due, I'd frantically search through what I had and look for notations or question marks and type all of that into the computer. Then came this stretch when I'd freak out because I was so sure I'd never be able to come up with another set of good questions. This involved a lot of chair rocking, throwing my head back, and sighing. But every time, they'd eventually appear. Now, why don't I do them slower or in advance? Because I needed to have all that I'd read compressed and swirling around in my head and bouncing off of each other 
so that my subconscious could make connections between the poems, essays, and interviews. It did become easier over time. I learned to cut out the yes and no questions and make them fuller. I also compiled a set that I typically asked each interview and use those as well. My preference was to conduct the interviews through email because it saved me time with transcription and editing. On the phone or in person, it typically only took an hour. So that's why the questions also needed to be molded so carefully. But it's amazing how much can be said in that time. One of the advantages of the phone or face-to-face -face interview was that I think the subliminal mind played a big role in the poet's responses. But why did I do this to begin with? Well, I molded this project after Bill Moyers, my personal hero, who took it to a different, but I took it to a different level. I heard him speak in New York a couple years ago, and he articulated that the spiritual aspects of poetry do not often get explored. So I felt I was on the right track. Personally, I was raised a Roman Catholic and currently consider myself a cultural Catholic. This shaped me in terms of mystery and liturgical imagination. But in graduate school, another driving force evolved in that I didn't think that poets had that much of a premeditated sense of what she or he was going to write. One might have some thoughts about the subject matter, but much of the rest was usually a surprise. And I was so disheartened by classes that claimed otherwise, that analyzed, critiqued, or mined poems for rigid meanings. I wondered, what do writers say about their own work and the process of writing, and the inner struggle of the act of putting something into words? Once a writer starts to really experience the flow and surge of writing, is that compulsion like a religious experience? Do some use writing as a practice to explore faith or belief through the lack of it? I suspect that persevering within the existential dialogues of denial and doubt can offer insights that that might actually be a way to access God or the way God has access to some. I was also intrigued by something I read in my Chinese poetry class about the experiences of reading and writing, and this filled in some essential gaps. And this is a quote. The most extensive analysis of Chinese writing to date was given by Li Yu in Chinese theories of literature. In it, he divides these theories into six categories the metaphysical, which was the interaction between universe and writer, the deterministic, which is also the interaction between universe and writer, the expressive, which is the interaction between writer and work, technical, which is work and ob as object, aesthetic, which is also work as object, and pragmatic, which is the interaction between work and audience. But there seemed to be a piece missing. So in that class, I suggested another possible theory and applied it specifically to poetry. I called this new final category the meta-metaphysical, which I saw as the interaction between audience and universe. This imposed a cyclical logic for this set of theories and furnished it with a sense of completeness. I'm not suggesting that this is true for all forms of poetry, but I believe that a potentiality exists for associations to occur between the writer or listener to something beyond the self. And I also believe that this is what some writers are inherently trying to achieve, a way to create through words and images the circular and symbiotic relationship of God working through the artist, and then that work reaching out to others to remind them of their own experience of God. This, of course, is God as you understand God. I recognize the quasi-authority and loftiness of that paragraph. I, a whole dissertation could be written compiling my ecstatic musings on this subject. But I was also truly interested in what others had to say on the topic. I wondered how off base I was. I wanted to know, what is a person's private, particular image of God? Is it a divine creator or the manifestation of some divine abstraction? I often can't tell. For me, God is frequently a divine distraction, and because of this, for now, I prefer to live in my investigations. One of the poets I was lucky enough to speak with was Fanny Howe. She wrote, the human heart doesn't want answers to questions so much as to lengthen the resonance of those questions. I think this says so much about poetry and the kinds of questions I ask about writing. The following are some themes and thoughts I asked almost every poet. I asked, how might poetry be like prayer, prophecy, ministry? Who writes the poem? Is there a self that writes the poem? Or some unknown other trying to rise up through language? Does the poem exist somewhere out in the universe and you listen for it? Does poetry deny us the maps on which we like to rely? 
and my personal favorite, what will it take to believe that God is only one among us? Of course, I receive very different answers from each person, and this has helped me shift some of my own perspectives. I'll now share a little bit uh, of excerpts from two of the poets. The first is from my 2001 interview with Lee Young Lee. I ask, in the past, you've stated that you're reading to a secret audience. It reminds me of the word namaste, a Buddhist word that basically means the light within me honors the light in you. Is that the secret audience, the feeling of this light inside of you trying to reach out? He answers, yes, I like that, namaste. Interesting. It's like a mutual divinity recognizing each other. That's why I'm a little confused about the presence thing when a person is reading, because I feel as if it's the deepest thing in me speaking to the deepest thing in the audience. I feel like in poetry, in a poetry reading, if I can kind of induce or remind a person of their inner spaciousness, their own inner richness, then I've done my job. But if they walk away thinking, oh, he's really smart, or he's really interesting, then I failed. And then uh, Martha Surpass, uh, she was raised a Roman Catholic, and she was one of the few that I actually felt comfortable talking with because we're the same age and have many similar experiences. So typically I had very well-formed questions, and I would just run through them. And, but with Martha, we would go back and forth. It was easier. I asked her, um, and this is interesting because Cheryl, uh, your poem kind of, uh, I think, was, was raising some of these concerns and, and musing about them. I said, um, once we talked about the idea of confessional poetry being switched to the poetry of witness, do you see any trends in contemporary writing about witness? She answers, my interest in witness started with Anne Sexton. I think her spiritual witness is very powerful and the whole label of confessionalism overshadows it. I tried to look at the poems that were written in the first person and say, well, what distinguishes a poem that I would say is a poem of witness from a poem with the derogatory label confessional? And I discovered that I thought there was a regard for the audience in the poems of witness, and also that there was more agency on the part of the first person that in the poems of witness, even though the I was sort of dissolving in order to give the reader an unmediated experience of what was happening in the poem, I did not feel acted upon or powerless. And so I say, well, what interests me about what you just said, and this comes back to the whole Catholic thing, is in Catholicism, there's the sacrament of confession. You go into the space, but you can't do it without a witness. Do you think poetry of witness is connected to that process in some way? And she says, I think confession is a wonderful thing. I mean the sacrament. But in terms of confession being practical in the church, you know, you and I belong to a generation that has very little trouble speaking about ourselves. But the generations that preceded us, at least in my experience, did. And many of those people only had a priest to talk to. But a lot of people do need a human person to say, it's OK. You're OK. Millions of people have done what you've done before and it'll be okay. I think that's very important on a human level. And from a spiritual, ritualistic perspective, I think honoring that, all aspects of our lives by speaking, is very powerful. And I think the ritual of saying, I am reflecting on my life, and this is what I see, and this is where I am, is crucial. When we have these conversations about where we are and what we're struggling with, that's sacred. Okay, I'm in this last section, I get into like this lyrical big finish mode, which is very common for me. But I like to also think uh, metaphorically about things, and so I sort of gonna end with that. Um, so I'll return to something else I read in my Chinese poetry class. Uh, Chang Chung Yuan states, in quotes, actual creativity requires no intellectual explanation in terms of process. It is rather a mere reflection of things. The following Chinese verse from the 8th century may help us to gain some insight into the nature of reflection. And this is a little poem. The wild geese fly across the long sky above. The image is reflected upon the chilly water below. The geese do not mean to cast their image on the water, nor does the water mean to hold the image of the geese. 
This little poem is a metaphor for the idea of reflection on creativity. Our minds are simply God's mirror, reflecting the here now of creation. Such, according to the Taoist, is the process of creation. But this creative reflection can only be understood through private intuition." End quote. It's possible that poetry and God may also be the dynamic forces that change as we change. By considering what does a poem mean, what does God mean, on your own terms might be enough. Let me return to this notion of reflection by extending that metaphor. The relationship between poetry and divinity may be similar to the way you stand at the edge of a pond and peer down at the water. The water can hold and reflect an image of you and also include the material around you. At the same time you see yourself, you also see through yourself to distinguish the sand and the stones and the moving fish. You see the water as the agent of that which gathers and that which reflects. Namaste. Is there, is there, do I have a little time to read a poem or two? Yes. Okay. Um, I have two poems to read. The first one I wrote during my Chinese poetry class, and uh, it's called The Seventh Day of the Seventh Month, and it's based on the Chinese uh, Valentine's Day, which is in supposedly July 7th. And it's kind of what would be called a little bit of an apostrophe where I address the gods and, and ask questions. The Seventh Day of the Seventh Month. Hey, you. Waiting around in heaven's river and waving the upper hand. Stop sending me messages about herd boys and loom weavers. There is no such thing as a considerate magpie, let alone a whole flock that would hinge and hover, linking wing with wing to form a bridge across the sky. Behind me, my future looms and struggles to dream each dream my past has already refused to turn me in the direction of love's animate possibility that brims and spills over like unexpected water being carried in two pale hands. And finally, uh, this poem is called Regeneration. There is a fire in a body but it is not my body. In my body, there is wood and flint. Whatever spark it held has been doused, like a vacant lighthouse ruined by storm. In the cowering brush of a back field, fireflies fidget like stars lowered on strings. Use the same jar you have reserved for your suffering to contain them. Place the open end on a hard surface then watch, then remember, then release. Now go to the shore of the nearest lake and part the water with the empty jar. The circles that yawn and expand will gyrate like the mouths of newborn birds. This host of combined hungers is a litany, body of, blood of, communion of fire. Thank you. And now moving on with this morning's feature, we have Anna Eder Mulhane joining us this morning. Anna Eder Mulhane is a bilingual, bicultural, Argentine American woman who grew up in Colombia, now living in Boston area. Anna also lived in Bogota, Belgrade, Madrid, London, and New York. As a child growing up in South America, Anna said that she loved reading and singing and caring for animals, and she loved horses and riding horses more than most things in the world. It sounds that Anna also grew up in a artist salon within her own family as well, with her father being a poet, writer, journalist, singer, songwriter, and her mother a painter. 
and a number of influential uncles and arts influencing the uh, Anna and her brothers and sisters as well, who also grew up to be uh, different kinds of artists. And Anna recalled that her father shared hundreds of songs with his children uh, and would usually get the guitar out every night. Anna grew up speaking, reading, writing, and singing in Spanish, French, and English, and went on to double major in Spanish and English at Holy Cross. And she received her MFA at Emerson College. Her previous work experiences are diverse, consisting of jobs such as a zookeeper, an advocate and a social worker for the elderly and the homeless, a shelter worker, a musical therapist, and a teacher. And currently, she works as a Spanish teacher for pre-K through fifth grade. And she is also a host of a, an open mic at Java Joe's in Jamaica Plain. And what Anna had to say about hosting and participating in an open mic is that she said, I began to write and perform about 10 more years ago when I began to attend local open mics. Open mics are such a deep and treasured source of courage, art, and community. It is such an honor and joy to be able to perform. I count myself lucky to do so amongst such talent and passionate dedication that can be seen in these venues. Anna writes and performs songs in her three languages and also has discovered songs and stories from Central, South, and North America and Europe that she loves to perform. And when asked how she spends her time sharing music and songs, Anna responded, Currently, I love to sing, play guitar, take guitar lessons, read, write, and strive to improve as a person and citizen and to work for the dissolving of the injustices of racism and prejudice that are still so prevalent here to share songs of, I'm not sure which language, but uh, very important and interesting. I'm sure I'm looking forward to hearing Anna's songs. Please help me welcome her. Anna Eder Mohan. I'm going to start singing a song that's very beloved in, in South America and sung around this time near Christmas. Wrote, um, 
there was a place I went to in Portland where while I was visiting a friend and it was called the Neon Cafe, so I went in and this song came out of that. a song I wrote uh, about uh, Victor Jara, who is a, was a revolutionary singer um, from Chile, who was uh, assassinated while he was, well, he was hurt very badly and uh, died from that while he was playing in a stadium. Uh, the dictator Pinochet did not want him to sing as he sung and wrote for people who were the poor or the working people. And he's a very beloved um, figure for everyone in South America and probably in North America too, if you know him or would know what he had done. And it's also about people who are working to help people who, who people who are 
disadvantaged have to put their trust into them. So anyway, it's a little complicated, but the song isn't that, so. <laughs> that Victor Jara wrote. Uh, it's addressed to a child who is called car Carne de Yugo, or flesh or child from the yoke, uh, born under the yoke of the work. And it says, who'll save this little child mm, who, who's tied, uh, like his mother, to the yoke just to work and not feel free, feel alive. Seguido con 
peligro para el cuello. Empieza a vivir y empieza a morir de punto a punto, levantando la corteza con su madre, con la junta. Contar sus años no sabe, ya sabe que el sudor es una corona grave, me salvar el labrador, me duele este niño hambriento como una grandiosa espina. Ay, y su vivir ceniciento revuelve mi alma vencida contar sus años no sabe ya sabe que el sudor es una corona grave me para el labrador y dónde saldrá el de los hombres fornaleros que antes de ser hombres son y han sido niños junteros oh, 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 oh. I don't know if this is allowed on this TV, but do you, what, what language would you like? Would you like English or Spanish or French? If anyone has a... French? Okay. This one is a, a story about a king who sees all, who has the, all his fair maidens or women brought to the court and it's a very old song, you can tell. It wouldn't really fly these days. <laughs> but it's a, an old song I learned from my father. And he has all the women brought in. And he says, oh, he tells the Marquis, his, his, man at our, his companion, he says, oh, Marquis, look at that beautiful woman. Who is she? And the Marquis says, well, Sarah, he, she's my wife. And, and the king says, oh. Well, if uh, you would like me to take care of her, I would be very grateful to you. And I would make you the leader of my army. And so that, that being the king and all, um, the marquis had to say goodbye to his wife. Mm, and the other end part is that the queen was there. And, and what she did was to welcome the lovely new woman. She made her a bouquet, which her scent was, would be poison to kill the Marquis. So, of course, it wouldn't fly today, this story. None of us are so silly. But uh, there's still, there's always truth, you know, to things. Fait battre le roi a fait battre tambour pour voir autour ces dames et une de celles qu'il a vu lui a ravi son âme Marquis dis-moi la connais-tu Qui dis-moi la connais tout qui est cette jolie dame? Le marquis lui a répondu, Sire, c'est ma femme. Marquis, tu es plus heureux que moi. Marquis, tu es plus heureux que moi d'avoir une femme si belle. Si vous voulez me la donner, je me 
chargerait de elle. Sir, si vous n'étiez pas le roi, Sir, si vous n'étiez pas le roi, j'en jurerais vengeance. Mais puisque vous êtes le roi, à votre obéissance. Marquis has to talk to his wife. Adieu, ma reine, adieu, mon cœur. Adieu, ma reine, adieu, mon cœur. Adieu, mon espérance. Est-ce qu'il faut obéir le roi? Nous séparons ensemble. fait faire un bouquet la reine a fait faire un bouquet de jolies fleurs de lise et le senteur de ces bouquets fait mourir la marquise le roi a fait battre tambour le roi a fait battre tambour pour voir tout ces dames et une de celles qu'il a vu lui a ravi son âme Thank you so much. Thank you Cheryl and Diane how beautiful your words. Thank you. And we are moving on to our third part of this morning's feature and I would like to share a few words about Afa Michael Weaver who comes from Somerville today was born and grew up in Baltimore with a favorite pastime as reading and as a child and a teenager said that he spent a lot of time studying he entered the University of Maryland at the age of 16 and then left a few years later to work in Baltimore as a blue collar factory worker for 15 years. And later went back to education and received his MA from Brown University. And that is when he began to take off with his writing of poetry. And he now is the author of 10 collections of his poems, including Talisman, from in 1998 in the Ten Lights of God in 2008, coinciding with his appearance on the cover of Poets and Magazine, Poets and Writers Magazine, which I have a very nice picture. And as Afa Michael Weaver began with his writing of poetry, then came the awards and honors as well. He's received the NEA, the Pew Award, Pennsylvania Arts Council Fellowship, and the Pushcart Prize. Afa also has taught at the National Taiwan University and Taipei National University of Arts as a Fulbright Scholar, and he speaks and writes and reads in Chinese. He is also a playwright and has received the PDI Award from ETA Theater in Chicago and is an accomplished essayist, short story writer, and editor. Afa also served as editor of Obsidian 3, the Journal of Black Creative Writing based at North Carolina State University, and currently he teaches at Simmons College, where he's director of the Zora Neale Hurston Literary Center of Simmons International Chinese Poetry Festival. And the festival recently took place here, I know, and uh, Afa was in China not long ago as well. And in 2005, he received a Gold Friendship Medal from the Chinese Writers Association in Beijing. When asked about the outcome of the festival, which recently took place in Boston and also in China, Afa said, I was happy to see people forming relationships across the distance of two languages that are very different. It was rewarding. And when asked about his observations on why poetry is important for the human condition, Afa noted, poetry is an indication that we are fully alive and not on life support systems. <laughs> Please help me welcome Afa Michael Weaver. To thank uh, all of you for 
for coming, and thanks, Cheryl, for inviting me. Um, it's really a pleasure. I enjoyed myself sitting back there so much. And I'd like to uh, today share some poems with you from my latest collection, The Plum Flower Dance, which has two Chinese characters on the left side, which actually are the same thing, Mei Wu. And it's uh, a book that covers 20 years of my work, and um, it comes after my reflection on my life as a uh, Taoist disciple. I am a Taoist disciple through my teacher, uh, Wang Qinliang, th to an organization in Taiwan. But the system has its origins in western China, in Xinjiang province near, uh, near Tibet. And uh, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it is said that the body has its own um, bright light. And uh, one of the major objectives of Taoist cultivation is to experience that light and harmonize your life with it and stay in contact with it, to make a long story short. But this book is also uh, organized according to the five elements and um, in the five element philosophy, or the Wu Xing in, in Chinese philosophy, you have uh, metal, water, wood, fire, and earth. And these combine and recombine in different arrangements to give us what we know as reality, but that also is in conjunction with um, um, the, the Bagua, the, the eight um, trigrams, which together give us the I Ching, the Book of Wisdom. So there are 64 poems in the book, as there are 64 uh, hexagrams in the uh, I Ching. Uh, <clears throat> so I could go on and I can pretend to know a lot about it and talk your ears off, but I'll read some poetry. <laughs> You know, to talk about Taoism is sort of counting. That's not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you're supposed to just do it. <laughs> uh, this poem is a, an old poem, um, and it's very short, and I'll begin here. It's entitled Ego. God's voice is caught in the crackling commotion of thought like dried leaves breaking. I have written across cultures, I've written out of the African American and into the Jewish. This poem is entitled Self Portrait and it is written to a painting by Mark Chagall from my, my collection entitled Stations in a Dream, which is all about the work of Mark Chagall, who was born in, in, uh, in Russia and um, had to travel away from Vitebsk, his native town, to study with a non-Jewish painter because Mosaic Law at that time said that you could not make graven images, you could not be a painter. Self-portrait. I see myself in the shadows of a leaf, compressed to the green blades growing to a point like the shards of miles of mirrors falling and cracking to perfect gardens. I never inspect the withered assumption of my face's petty dialogue and raindrops the deceptive spreading of the words oozing from the skin to the edges of water etched on the ground by gravity and wishing. Passing for the seriousness of my eye, platitudes of my white collar or the perfect posture of my lips, it skirts from the leaves of the plant hiding me and sits stoic like stone in my pupil, mute and unassuming like Rasha. To gather myself, I will swim naked in the wind, bending my blind elbows in circles, stopping now to dance like the cherub in gold on the ark, and gather myself from the particles of this excitement, another structure, one closely resembling the beginning. As poets, I think we should always support one another and acknowledge each other's support. Um, the late poet Reginald Shepard, who just passed away, unfortunately, at a young, young age, I'm 56, be 57 in a couple of weeks, and he was about 10 years younger than I am. But I'm told that he liked this poem, and in those secret, secret circles of fellowships and so on, and I had applied for something, I've been told that he stopped the meeting to read this poem. 
So I want to read this for Reginald Shepherd. Lamentations. If only my soul were a messy garage outside the house I have always wanted, then I would be a pile of fenders, old tires and engine parts, carburetors on shelves, wrenches everywhere, buckets of dirty oil, some skeleton of a car in the middle with old lawnmowers. It would be a tinker's joy, you in the corner there sitting beside me, the two of us not quite finished, not joined with wires that pull the current around, make the lights go. I could go over to you, shuffle over step in puddles of grease and grime, follow the squeak of your voice like the up and down of old springs. Putting your parts with my parts, we look like the working thing that we should be. Sputtering, we come to life, and this stumbling mechanic we have been for so long falls into a pile of boats, wires, nuts, panels, and grease. He sleeps while you and I resurrect him whole and full. Then we die again, fall back into the incompleteness. Back and forth this goes until, in one realization, a brand new car rolls out of the garage. We sit in it, me driving, adjusting the radio with a license plate saying, Father and Son. I um, had a habit for just a couple of years of traveling to Bar Harbor, Maine, um, which is a beautiful place. And there used to be an antique shop on the road heading out to, um, to the beach. And it was owned by a man and his wife, uh, Walter, and his wife, Gertrude. And Walter and Gertrude met in Vietnam when they were serving. And um, Walter had a pearl white beard. It was beautiful. And um, they were quite the pair. And uh, I was so taken with them. And uh, I went back to um, New Jersey, where I was living at the time, and wrote this poem for them. I wanted to give this to them. And um, when I came back to give it to them, I had discovered that they had taken their lives together, a double suicide. Mm -hmm. Their nephew told me. The final trains of August for Michael S. Harper. He stands in the unfinished door of his antique shop above Bar Harbor. He leans on the sill to relieve his trick knees, watches the final trains of August. Vacationers with their bicycles on the tops of RVs and minivans. Teenagers with their feet propped in the window. They mimic some abandoned coin the long way off. He counts the possible customers. The accountants from Boston with their neat wives who move through his collection smug and sure like necromancers who make money out of the sagacious purchase. Or the infrequent southerners who betray summers of the south for the cool nights and mountains of Maine with its wilderness and its infinite lay of lakes. He watches and imagines what stragglers will land in his world of sundry history. I want a window, she says, and Walter announces himself. He holds out his pearl white beard. Walter Francis, retired colonel and antique trader at your service. I want a window, she repeats. He takes her into the basement, past some yellow Jehovah's Witness books spread in a basket, past a collection of chairs where people had their breakfasts, or where they watched the chill of autumn come in with full colors. They move past tables where folks serve tea to neighbors who pass time with grace, past the baby scale where doctors held protesting children to see how much they had grown back before the electronic scale in Similac. They reach the old windows. Her face breaks open and brightens. Where is this from? What time? What house? She presses her palm to a pane. Ma'am, I get these windows from all over this region and beyond. She persists, prodding on. What house? What house is this? He pulls the suspenders holding him. Ma'am, this was a quiet house. Off to itself, where the rain beat like light fingers on a drum. 
She takes it quickly, writes the check in tight, even letters, announces that she is an artist. Walter lights a Marlboro. I get them all, he muses. Everybody comes to Walter Francis. Gertrude and I built this place, he tells a couple from Hartford. Gertrude walks across the road. She runs a motel, and I run this fabulous collection of the old. Gertrude reaches them, moves as easy as a teenager, with legs long and supple as they were when she was an Air Force lieutenant to Walter's Vietnam colonel. They believe that nothing but the end could stop them, the end that comes to all of us and to everything we own, the end that falls to the caring hands of angels and preservationists. She reaches them, speaks loudly, Walter, I'm going to unload that truck. It'll be dark soon, too dark to work. He growls softly, Gertrude, go on back to the motel, go on. She ignores him, moves to the truck, tosses in the new antiques like a stevedore. Things new to this way station of the old, but unforgotten. That woman thinks she's my boss. After I took this business to be rid of the overseers, the judges. The young couple ponders a relay box from the 1880s, precisely kept in a wooden cabinet, polished, tightened, and smooth. They decline and move out into the brisk air of the evening to make the night drive to Hartford. The last stranger fills a threshold, a young man who travels alone. He is up from Providence to see the mountain of the Roosevelt's Cadillac Mountain, where FDR came to forget the weight of guiding America. The stranger considers buying an old-fashioned life preserver made of tamarack wood. Walter takes his cue to land a lecture on the origin of his house, built in the 18th century by a man who built frigates and schooners for a living. Walter explains the house is a seagoing vessel, tight and solid. He could lift it and move it today and not even disturb it. The nursery floor is tamarack because that kept life's noise at bay. The house has outlived endings. The stranger pushes his fingers into the night air, marvels at the stars. Walter reminisces about the Orient, where he wondered if adventure lay in what the dead leave behind. In the sick humidity of Vietnam, he made a regular route to our last heralded door and stopped just short of hearing the answers. The stranger from Providence coughs to break the meditation and then climbs roughly into an old Chevrolet with scabs of rust. He drives away toward the ocean. Walter hobbles on his trick knees, turns off the lights, closes down the shop with its unfinished walls. At the road's edge, he lights a Marlboro, blows a smoke ahead, walks into it as he listens to the regrets of the dead. This um, past Tuesday was Veterans Day, and I think I'll read a poem for, for veterans. I'm a veteran myself. I served in the Army Security Agency from 1970 to 1973, and um, um, I was um, a cook in the intelligence unit. <laughs> Two oxymorons, eh? <laughs> and I was trained at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, which in the military we call Little Korea because the terrain and the weather was such that during the Korean War it was very good for training men to go to Korea, but we were being trained to go to Vietnam. So at the end of the training, half of us were shipped out for active duty and the rest of us came home to wait. So I was on first call for three years for Vietnam. And um, so I belonged to the American Legion, although I didn't go to combat. I served during the time of war. I volunteered also. And my um, drill instructor in, in cooking school was Sergeant Musial, who was nephew to Stan Musial, the great baseball player. And um, he had been to Vietnam three times, I believe, and he wanted to go back again, and they barred him from Vietnam. He had several medals. Right? So for the men who I served with in, uh, in the military, for all veterans, the Southpaw. The fist is a hand that has made decisions. 
It has sat on a rock holding its thoughts over the edge of a lake, weighing this, weighing that. It has paced through woods in autumn, kicking leaves over matters philosophical and literary. It has thought. It has prayed to a God who knows hands and what hands can do in a malleable world. The 16-ounce boxing glove is a fist that never unfurls. Inside it, your hand is forced to conclusions. The glove magnifies the hand and softens it. It makes a fist that is both dangerous and heavy to haul and throw. It protects and threatens. It is like the black flash across space to the face like a lightning bolt burnt with voltage. In the barracks, we fought for pride. A pound here, a pound there. We battle for the turf of striding out in the sun, smiling. I fought a boy from Kentucky who kept a picture of his Plymouth Roadrunner on his locker. I had nothing against him except he thought he could beat me. He hit me out of Louisville with a left. The eye makes stars when the fist pushes it into the skull socket. A fraction of a second and you are blind, grasping around for focus. I stood away, arched my back, flipped my head to rattle him with glove and a grit from a right. He sat and said, I've had it, no more. Hands can break bodies, bone on bone. Now, it's been said that I study Chinese, and I, I started studying Chinese seriously when I was 50 years old, and, uh, which is a little late, but not impossible. And uh, so at Simmons, I took uh, advantage of the uh, faculty audit, and for two years, I did the undergraduate program at Simmons. The students loved it because I was suffering. You know? <laughs> and I had to do all the work, homeworks, tests, and so on. But after that, I moved to Taiwan, and I, it was my sabbatical year, 2004 to 2005, and I lived there for eight months. I only came stateside once for a conference and went right back. And so every day I had two hours of tutorial, just myself and the teacher, Dwei Dwei, as they say in Chinese, one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, it was difficult, um, but I really learned. And um, it was um, also a very special experience because I was the only black man in my neighborhood. And I, I lived with my landlord and his family. His wife had just passed away that spring. So he and his sons and a few other tenants, we all lived on the top floor of the building, the 16th floor, right in the middle of Taipei's um, commercial district near Sogo's department store. And this poem is, uh, is about that experience. And um, it's entitled, Theme for Intermediate Chinese after Langston Hughes' theme for English B. Teacher recites and I follow, copying her words, taping the class so I can listen at home. Make sentences, she says, one for every word. And I count them in Chinese, building the tones from memories. A child of the 50s, it is a time of my 50s when I rub my hair and touch only the wrinkly skin that has forgotten hair. I count days as gifts now. Homework is a gift. And this small flat 12,000 miles away on the other side of forgetting and remembering. I take the MRT subway to my neighborhood, walk past a lady who is not so nice, to the faces that warm and brighten when I pass. Through the park with children, slides, swings, and old women under the trees, across the tiles of the walkway to my building to press my security key to the elevator. Kiss it softly to say, it's me again, as if the key doesn't know the only black man in the neighborhood. War is a word for I, and it sounds like woe's sadness, or woe. The sound to stop the worrying of things. I practice it, writing over and over, rolling on the sound of the elevated train going by, where everyone knows I is me. 
I meditate on the congregation of genes and wishes that brought me here, counting back the four generations to the first African, naming along the way the Native Americans, Europeans, the polka dot army of chromosomes and molecules, like tiny spaceships that align themselves with mystic glue, so that I am the same mystery each day, and do not dissolve into a glob in the midst of Taipei's rush to go and buy things, as I recite alone to myself the Chinese for going and buying. What have I bought in this place, where only the inside can matter, and the outside is so many things to so many, and who are we? The Chinese sentence for this takes me all night into the slide of constellations over night markets and the humid cling of music to silence. We are genes. We are the art of the mind of some great emptiness above or here below inside the bulb of a beat, things that grow underground and thrive on darkness, the humble fullness of light. I um, have had my DNA analyzed. Would you like to know what it says? <laughs> there is one, one of those online ancestry things. It's in, out in Arizona, so you scrape the inside of your cheek and put it into a little vial and ship it out there. And so it came back, and um, my DNA is spread from uh, the eastern side of Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, up around Egypt, and into Israel. I have two Israel. Um, correspondences, Israel or Jewish correspondences in my DNA, one Arab, up across the North African coast, one in Germany, one in Ireland, <laughs> back down on the West Coast, mostly in the French-speaking countries, but also in Nigeria, and then in Cape Verde, which is Portuguese, off the coast of Africa, I have ten correspondences, so you figure it out. <laughs> So people was talking about African Americans. We're like a holding tank for <laughs> the entire human race. You know? it's, uh, it's unbelievable. And a Jewish friend of mine, I also go to bagel bars on Saturday morning sometimes. And um, one of my Jewish colleagues at bagel bars, I was explaining my, my Jewish DNA. He said, well, I have to start calling you Weaverwitz. You know? <laughs> But my book, The Ten Lights of God, is, um, is, 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 was inspired by the Kabbalah. And uh, it um, takes on the idea of God's body, uh, this anthropomorphic diagram having ten lights. And there's Kader, El Hokmah, Bina. And um, there are a few of those poems, four of them to be exact, that actually begin four of the sections in this book. And the section on love um, has the eighth light, which, and I forget what Hokma Abina, but it's one in the shoulders. Excuse me. And um, so it's about love, and I will end with this, um, this poem that's um, about God's body for a spiritual day. And it's poem number 63 from, from the book. The eighth light bonds the opposing wills of love, light must endure light. Thank you. Um, my first poem is called My Dog. He barks at my scrumptious toast. I take a bite. My teeth squeeze into the toast. He barks again. My finger is wrapped in jelly. I put my hand down. He licks it and I smile. <laughs> and then my um, second and last poem is called What is Orange? Orange is a sunset on a hot summer day. It is a bouncing ball wanting to play. It is happy, exciting, and cool. It is a bright and sunny stool. Orange is lava, flaming hot. It is a rope tied in a knot. It moves, it squirms, making no sound. It is a gentle hound. Orange is sunshine. Orange is fine. Orange is mine. I wrote this poem called Voices in May, uh, excuse me, just before the election, May 2000. But I think it's appropriate today. Voices. There is a voice waiting to be heard. In each of us, there is a voice waiting. Quietly and then sometimes not so. Do I hear these words in me? Can I look back and know that I have heard this sound? 
Unseen within, the voice utters up so much, but I often drown it out with words of others, solid stated, overstated, compensated. Let me take my ears internal, bark and beetle blessed, rotate the cochlea small, and listen instead to symphony of soul. This microphone awareness, bony pickup to inner realms, join the words of you and I to sing along with harmonious choral voice. These earnest tones of self, dulcet though they be, deserve conductor's eye. Why do muted notes of me and you stay back to never link with vibrant stick? Breathe deep, I say, and speak your mind. Give voice in public place and say your peace. For if silence be the only song, how can we complain of other strident sounds? Uh, this first one is very short. It's a, a limerick. The seventy-something. The seventy-something spry cow took her bull by the horns and asked, how shall we manage to dance with a splash of romance if we can't get back up when we bow? <laughs> and this uh, next one is inspired to some extent, uh, or rather I, I take something from Diane Bilyak's idea about spiritual aspects. She brought the sense of spiritual, which reminds me of how, after I left the church, I stopped one day and breathed a sigh of relief because I had managed, before I left the church, to baptize my four children. The spiritual will out. <clears throat> That's the name of the poem is Consider the Rest. The king in this poem may resemble King Tut. In death, the king was wrapped in jeweled seer cloth, his pickled lungs and liver sealed in jars. A hundred sculpted slaves by hawk-eyed bark secured his passage to the nether world. The mortuary clothed my aunt in damask. Her nails were varnished red, her hair fresh quaffed. And just before they sealed the satin lid, her daughter dropped aunt's charge cards in the box. Um, this song, somewhat spiritual experience, um, if you've ever uh, been so fortunate as to have been skydiving, it really makes you um, think about your place in the world. So, <laughs> this, song <is> called, <laughs> this song is called Jumper. Thank you. 
senses overload And now I fly through the center of a picture perfect rainbow And looking down I am just a speck of this big amazing world below Taking mental pictures Trying to hold on to each image Tasting smells of wind, hearing skies of blue, surrounded by the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And now I fly through the center of a picture perfect rainbow. Just a speck of this big amazing world below And looking down I am just a speck of this big amazing world My poem today is coming from my experience taking the self-guided tour in the Carlsbad Caverns where we walked down uh, 800 feet into the earth and its transformation of my perceptions. It's called Carlsbad Butterfly. Steps steeply cascading downward reveal rock walls, earthy smells, trickling streams, then absolute darkness. Haunting familiarity creeps inward. Stone silence breaks. Soft voices murmur before, long before. Mind's eye sees earthlings climbing crystal pillars, settled, blessing cavernous homeland. Startling vision ignites thunderbolts. Truth, knowing, deep origination, cosmic dust, molten liquids, fire, miraculously unfolding like butterflies emergence. I would actually look at a different poem for today, but then considering the weather, I thought this one seemed somehow more appropriate, and it also has a touch on human condition as well. It's called Rainy Ramble. Three miles in the rain on the roads, three walkers on a ramble over ridges, three miles, Hopkinton Center to Woodville, Mass. Why the ramble? To face a challenge, to break the gray day, to say we did, to get cold, tired, wet, then warm to unbalance the ordinary. An interlude seems soon as long past, brief walk and briefer stopping off, then back to indoor gray day. And such is life often, sparks of opportunity to be seized amidst the otherwise gray. This is uh, a poem by Richard Wilbur entitled The Writer.
room at the prow of the house where light breaks and the windows are brushed by linden my daughter is writing a story I pause in the stairwell hearing from her shut door a commotion of typewriter keys like a chain hauled over a gunnel Young though she is, the stuff of her life is a great cargo, some of it heavy. I wish her an easy passage. and its easy figure. A stillness greatens in which the whole house seems to be thinking. And then she is at it again with a bunched clamor of strokes. And again, of that dazed starling which was trapped in that very room two years ago. How we stole in, lifted a sash, and retreated so not to frighten it. And how for a helpless hour through the crack of the door we watched that sleek, wild, dark and iridescent creature batter against the brilliance drop like a glove to the hard floor or the desktop and wait there humped and bloody for the wits to try it again and how our spirits rose when suddenly sure it lifted off of the chair back beating a smooth course for the right window and rising over the sill of the world. It is always a matter of life or death, my darling, as I had forgotten. I wish what I wished you before, only harder. called a uh, power of a word. I used to just to mimic only other people's word, but I decided to learn English, so here you go. With the word, I learned to hate and to curse myself, being born a girl in a male-dominated society. With the word, I learned to mold myself worthless, filling in others' shoes and knees, growing up as an orphan, crawling shed of a steep hierarchy mountain. With the word, I learned to not to think, nor to ask questions, suppressing feeling, tying tongue, only to follow commands of others, for they might accept me. With the word, I learned, I learned I'm not so stupid, even though environment accustomed to cast the girls down for my own father who taught me how to read and to write before my first day of school. With the word, I learned also to be stupid and fear word, moving to America as an adult without English, my only hopeful outlook. Time will teach me quickly faded along with self-esteem. Being married, K 
can do in house. Day in, day out, shouts of snapping, snobbish, book smart, intelligent, husband's world, stupid, helpless, poor enough, couldn't do anything right, so to me to step with the world. I am now learning now, chasing all those fear brewing and heart choking world that start me to grow, being true to myself. Thank you. One of the things I loved about this morning was hearing the term poems, poets of witness, because I, I, I didn't realize it, but I think that's what I am. And this poem is um, a poem of witness. It's called Their Poem. At a holiday party where the air and the people all glittered a bit, five single mothers, women I knew from Little League games and school functions, stood around a tall table. Seen across the room, they glowed like crescent moons. I tell them, I will write a poem about how elegant and mighty you are. They laugh and say, who us? A poem about us? In trying to capture their splendor in words, I search for a metaphor. I find Artemis, the hunter goddess, who wandered the magical forests of ancient Greece. Known as the protector of dewy youth, she was also called the lady of wild things. She was a virgin who shunned the company of men. Myths like all stories, evolve. So at that party, two millennium later, Artemis reappeared. Her coterie of nymphs became Artemis too. That's why I saw five Artemis, Artemises, mothers all, sipping wine. This is their poem. <laughs> Bendito sea, bendito sea, ya la nanita, na na nanita, eh, a nanita, eh, eh, a mí, Jesús tiene sueño, bendito sea, bendito sea.